What's up everyone, Soldier First Class here, and today's mission, we're going to be talking about Aerith and a huge secret she seems to be holding in Final Fantasy VII Remake. Keep in mind, this video will be loaded with spoilers for several moments in Final Fantasy VII Remake and the original game. I also want to mention that the last theory video we did, 7 seconds till the end, has been debunked. 7 seconds is actually referring to the last 7 seconds before the impact of Meteor. This evidence is found in the story description in your map menu. Now let's get into today's theory. It wasn't until after I had finished the game and started an another playthrough of it that I started to notice some odd behavior from Aerith. I think it's hard to catch the first time, but when you go back and look, Aerith seems to always know what's going on or where to be. There are times where she may stay too long or even say things that she shouldn't know already, and it got me wondering about what she's not telling us. There's a few ways to interpret these scenes, but I'm going to talk about what they mean in the context that we're given once the game is completed. With Cloud's premonitions of the future at every turn, it also made me wonder what Sephiroth was doing and how Cloud would be seeing events that technically hadn't happened yet. In the original game, all of Cloud's visions were in the past, but of this time, he's seeing the future as well. But what if, this Aerith is actually from another timeline, attempting to stop the world from ending? In the end of the game, there's a specific moment where Red 13 alludes to the ending of Final Fantasy VII being the bad ending. This scene is where Red is running towards a destroyed Midgar, which takes place 500 years later. Confirmed by Yoshinori Kitase, when the game goes 500 years into the future, mankind is extinct. If you were to use that as a standard for an ending, that would technically be a bad ending for humankind. We'll go into why this is important and the importance of the planet's will later in the video, though. If this truly is the bad ending for this universe, then the party will be attempting to keep that from happening in the remake's timeline. We have evidence of alternate timelines because of the chip bag scene with Zack and what appears to be him alive. But what's interesting to note is that the last thing you see before the credits roll on the original game is Aerith's face. Fast forward to Final Fantasy VII Remake, and after the cinematic intro begins, we see Aerith's face in the iconic presentation that it had in the original. The Mako energy in the broken pipe is flowing out, and it's almost as if Aerith is talking to it. Sephiroth's music is playing in the background, and she looks immediately down the alleyway, almost as if she can feel Sephiroth is there. I also believe Sephiroth to be from another moment in time. I didn't originally think that there was an actual time travel involved, but the more I look at it, the harder it is to deny. What begins the theory is Aerith standing on Loveless Street, almost as if she's waiting to bump into Cloud knowing he'll be there. She's not moving around, not offering to sell anyone flowers, she's just waiting patiently for Cloud to show up. It's also interesting to note that Cloud has a vision of Sephiroth here. In his mind, Aerith is frozen in place by Sephiroth as he's being tormented. However, Aerith walks up to Cloud, asking if he's okay, as if she was never even frozen. I think what we're seeing here is that some visions are from the regular Sephiroth in the North Crater, just like they were in the original game, and other future visions are the ones from the future Sephiroth. The events play out differently as well, because in the original, you can either get the flower or not, and if you didn't, then she just walks away. In the remake, Aerith makes a point of giving you the flower, no matter what answer you you give. Almost as if she's giving him some kind of clue about what's going on. And it's interesting because of how she words it. She states, lovers used to give these when they were reunited. Cloud then warns her that he's involved in dangerous things, and she brushes it off as if she already knows. The whispers of fate appear and chase Aerith away, almost as if Aerith is about to say something she shouldn't, or is keeping Cloud here in this place too long. The next moment with Aerith is inside the Sector 5 church, just after Cloud comes crashing through the ceiling. Aerith begins to talk about the materia her mother left her, and Cloud has a premonition of her death. This will be the first time of many that he sees this image, and as Reno walks in, there's a very subtle thing that is easy to miss. Aerith states, he's my bodyguard, and a soldier. Pretty cool, huh? Cloud seems confused, but then she states, you don't mind, do you? Bodyguard work's not too different from Merc stuff, right? Cloud then lets out another confused grunt, and Aerith clarifies, uh, I guessed, from the sword. Now this could have just been a lucky guess, but she knows he's a soldier, a mercenary, and seemed to recognize the sword already, so something tells me that she knows more than she's letting on. You could make one of two arguments. She recognizes the sword from Zack, or she's from the future timeline where she knows who Cloud is already. With the current state of the remake, I'd say it's probably leaning towards the second argument. Then there's Reno himself, who after being defeated, is about to be struck down by Cloud. We know from the original that this never happened, and when Cloud goes to finish him off, Aerith screams at Cloud to stop, and the Watchmen show up to take them away. This is to keep Reno from dying before he's meant to, something Aerith appears aware of already. But you could also say that Aerith holds a certain affection for the Turks, considering she's known them her whole life. There's also a moment in the attic of the church where Aerith almost explains to Cloud what the whispers are, but then stops herself, almost as if she's afraid of altering the timeline before it's the proper time. After Cloud escorts Aerith to her house, they share a small interaction with Elmira. Cloud is about to head back to Sector 7, and Aerith offers to escort him. Pretty normal, but she also makes a remark about Cloud that makes you think she already knows all about his personality. 
She asked him, what if you get lost, huh? You'd be too embarrassed to admit it, and so you'd just keep going. Cloud even responds to her, quit acting like you know me. Next, there's a short scene in the Sector 5 slums just after you save the kids. One of the Sephiroth clones appears and falls over. Aerith and Cloud go to check on him, and then he grabs Cloud's arm. Cloud begins to see Sephiroth, who mentions the reunion. Cloud then explains to Aerith that he thinks Sephiroth is still alive, to which Aerith replies, oh, right. The camera zooms into her lips as she says the words, and they're setting it up cinematically as if Aerith already knows that Sephiroth is still alive. Fast forward to a scene with Aerith and Cloud in her garden. She appears to be talking to the flowers and makes a few remarks about them. She states, It won't be much longer now. The flowers. They... They have something important to tell us. Something they... need to share with us. At least that's the feeling I get. But before they can, there's a final step that has to be taken. She then clenches her fist and says, Otherwise, we won't hear them. She then talks about giving up and saying it's the only thing she's good at, and Cloud tells her that from what he sees, she's no quitter. She then states that today is special, and that's why she worked so hard. When Cloud questions why the day is so special, she looks as if she wants to tell him something, but just laughs and walks away. In the context of this theory, I think she's saying this day is special because this is the day that she meets Cloud, and she's able to relive these moments with him again. On the way back to Sector 7, Aerith somehow ends up ahead of Cloud due to her stand the world, allowing her to pause time and get ahead of Cloud. Because you guessed it, Final Fantasy 7 is in fact a JoJo reference. Nah, but seriously, Cloud ends up having a vision of something that causes him to shed a tear as he watches Aerith walk away. Since they weren't shy about showing the few clips of her death, I'm assuming that Cloud witnessed the entire scene this time. I think he saw that what his visions have meant is that Aerith will die and he won't be able to stop it from happening. This would explain why the player isn't shown this scene, even though they show split-second clips of it three or four times throughout the game. We then have the famous playground scene with Aerith and Cloud. It appears to me that Aerith is attempting to jog Cloud's memory in this scene as she actually uses Zack's name. Cloud has another headache and it blurs out Zack's name. She then stares into his eyes, but then says she's wasted enough of his time. In the original game, she never mentions Zack by name, only that her previous boyfriend was in Soldier. We also know that from Zack's parents in Gaga that Cloud never even remembered Zack's name, so this is definitely something new they've added, and leads me to believe that Aerith is just fishing here. Later on, Aerith attempts to save Marlene at 7th Heaven due to the plate about to fall. Before she leaves, Tifa asks her to go to 7th Heaven, and Aerith cuts her off and says that she'll go save Marlene. Tifa does look confused at first, but goes on to the plate tower to help Cloud. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't recall Aerith ever hearing about Marlene until this point, so if that's true, Aerith knew who she was before Tifa even said anything. When Aerith comes into contact with Marlene, she places her hand on her, and in the same way that the Whispers of Fate show people the future, she clearly showed Marlene something that helps her calm down, possibly something about Barrett being okay. It's pretty clear that Aerith is using some type of ability that she has through being a Cetra, which makes the Whispers even more interesting. It also makes me wonder if Marlene may actually be of Cetra heritage. In the original game, before the aftermath, one of the last things you see is Marlene saying, the Flower Girl, meaning she can feel Aerith in the livestream. In the end of Final Fantasy VII Remake, Marlene is watering the flowers at Aerith's house. She goes to walk away when Elmira calls for her, but then turns around and says, Daddy? It then goes immediately to Barrett holding out his hand to her and saying he'll be back. She may not be an ancient, but there's more than meets the eye to Marlene than originally thought. There are several events like these throughout the game, but now I want to fast forward to the Shinra HQ. The team meets Red 13 and he appears to be super aggressive and doesn't trust the party, and Aerith reaches out to him and touches his head. At this time, Aerith uses the same power she used on Marlene to calm his mind. I would also assume that she showed him a future where the party and him become allies and what the Watchmen of Fate are. This allows Red to tell the party so that Aerith doesn't have to, since they could view her saying it as changing destiny. When Cloud wakes up in Aerith's room, they begin to talk about the Ancients. Barret says to take Aerith and go, and that he's going to go bust some Shinra heads. Aerith tells him to wait, and that he can't go do that. At this point, the Whispers of Fate show up. Red 13 explains that destiny is the will of the planet and the Whispers of Fate, and that the Whispers are meant to keep anyone meaning to deviate from the planet's will from doing so. The Whispers always seem to be around Aerith, and whenever she is about to say or do anything against what the planet has ordained as fate, they appear to stop her. Red 13 also claims that he didn't know what the Whispers were until Aerith touched him with her power. Aerith tells the party that Shinra is not the real enemy. She explains that it began with Shinra, but that there's a much bigger threat. She wants to help everyone in the planet, but she feels trapped in a maze. She also states that every time the Whispers touch her, she loses a piece of herself. If Aerith is in fact a time traveler, it could be that the Whispers are causing her to lose her memories of traveling back to the past. 
This would help ensure that she knows as little as possible about preventing the future from happening. It's painfully obvious by now that Aerith knows the future, or at least knows more than she's letting on. There's a few ways to explain this. If destiny and fate are the will of the planet, Aerith's Cetra heritage would allow her to see that destiny or future. She'd be able to use that knowledge to prevent certain things from happening, or she's a time traveler and the exact moment the ending scene played in the original, she time traveled into her own body that is shown at the beginning of Final Fantasy VII Remake. So I do want to reference something from the compilation, and there's a passage from On the Way to a Smile, a Final Fantasy VII novel that talks about Aerith and her time in the livestream. It states, She was an ancient, thus she was able to retain her own selfhood even within the flow of the livestream. When she wished it, she could dissolve that self and become part of the planet forever, but it was too soon for that. She could feel an aberration in the coursing livestream, an implacable will that refused to merge with the planet. She knew it was the man who killed her, a man whose fine, handsome features had hidden the vicious spirit that now plotted and schemed within the livestream. She sensed he was trying to exert his power in the corporeal world. She wanted to stop him, but how? It was too dangerous to come into contact with him. She stayed far away from his cruel consciousness. That made it harder to discern his intentions, but the one time she did stray dangerously close, she learned something important. His memories of Cloud formed the core of his will. Cloud was her friend, more than a friend, for she had loved him. He was a symbol of everything she held dear. She would protect him. This book takes place between Advent Children and the end of the original game, but it proves that Aerith is capable of remaining intact in the livestream until she sees fit. If Sephiroth has figured out a way to travel to the past, or even worn his past self in some way, then it's possible that Aerith could have had the same ability. But I also want to talk about what this means for the planet itself. In the original game, Bugenhagen claims that if the planet feels threatened, it will do what it must to eliminate the threat, even if that means destroying mankind to preserve itself. With that being said, after Kitase confirmed that mankind is extinct at the end of the game, that means the planet did just that. Because of the evil that is mankind, the planet resorted to killing them all in the name of self-preservation. That's the destiny that the planet is trying to preserve, but the destiny that Aerith wants to stop. The problem is, how do you stop Sephiroth, but also stop the planet from killing mankind? If the planet wishes that Meteor be summoned, then the Whispers of Fate were there to make sure that that happened. Let's be real here, the planet and the Whispers are not evil. It may seem that way because of how the end plays out, but the planet is only trying to protect itself. Years of Mako production, wars, and even Genova has caused the planet to shift into survival mode. Does this make the planet's will evil? I don't necessarily think so, but it could be interpreted that way, but it only has an allegiance to itself. That's why certain things like Barret's death are reversed, because without Barret, the timeline is shifted and it's possible that this changes the planet's fate in some way, a ripple effect in the timeline if you will. There's a moment at the end of the game where Sephiroth appears at the end of the Broken Highway. Aerith talks to him as if she's already known him for a long time. She tells him that he's wrong, that all of him is wrong. After the flashback they see of Zack, Sephiroth opens up the portal to Destiny's Crossroads. Before Cloud heads into the portal, Aerith stops him, but she doesn't know why she stopped him. If memory loss is a side effect of the Whispers touching her, it's possible that she is losing that reason, but still knew she needed to do something. Aerith uses her powers to create a portal of her own inside the portal Sephiroth made. She explains to the party that Sephiroth will tell him that he only cares about the planet and that he wishes to do nothing but save it. But she also explains that he doesn't care about the planet at all. The words of the planet don't reach him, that he will feel nothing if the planet dies. She explains that this isn't the way that it's supposed to be, and she clenches her fist and states that there's no bigger threat to the planet than him. Aerith knows him somehow, without ever having met him. That tells me one of two things. The planet is telling her about him being in the North Crater, or this is Aerith from the future trying to change the course of history. But she does give the party a warning, that if they choose to do this, it will forever change who they are and their destiny. That they will find freedom, but a terrifying freedom. When the Whispers are destroyed at the end of the game, they show the party glimpses of the future, a future the planet is trying to protect. This is why Red 13 announces that this is a bad ending and the result of what will happen if they fail to stop Sephiroth in the alternate dimension. There's one last point that I'd like to make, and it's that this game, to me, is definitely a sequel to the compilation. Tetsuya Nomura once said in an interview that in his mind he had started the remake project a long time ago, that he wanted to make it a compilation title that would occur after the original compilation. If he got his wish, that may be what we're seeing in Final Fantasy VII Remake. Remake may not be what this game is in the traditional industry sense, but what if it means to remake the timeline and not a remake of the original game? That's the type of meta-narrative that Nomura and Toriyama love to inject into their games, and it's pretty much what the Whispers of Fate were to begin with. You could make the argument that the Whispers of Fate are the purest fans who just wanted a one-for-one -one remake, and by defeating the Watchmen of Fate, they have defeated the restraints placed on them by those fans. It's definitely a somewhat cool meta-narrative, I just wish that concept would have been a little bit more well-executed.
Overall, we have a potentially highly convoluted plot if this is the case, but I could definitely see it going in this direction. Did Aerith time travel? I'm not entirely sure, but it's either that or she was able to communicate with her past self and provide all the information she would need to change fate. Whatever this means, I think there's a certain significance to how Aerith begins and ends the original game. Along with evidence from extended works, it appears that the entire compilation is being used for this story and that things are about to get super complicated, but it also makes sense why the original compilation is no longer canon. It's definitely a crazy ride, and while I'm not a fan of the first game's ending, I am still very excited to see where this ride actually takes us. It's my personal hope that Part 2 will arrive in the next few years, and that I'll grow to love this ending after having completed Part 2. So what do you think, soldiers? Did Aerith and Sephiroth time travel? Thanks for watching, and don't forget to omni slash that like button. Let me know in the comments section below what you think has happened in Final Fantasy VII Remake. Subscribe to the channel, and ring that notification bell to join the ranks of Soldier today. And for all the latest Final Fantasy VII Remake news, rumors, and trailers, I'm Soldier First Class, and I'm on to the next mission. Later, guys.